Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast is sponsored by MeatUndies.com, the most comfortable underwear you will ever wear. It's insane how good they make you feel. They sent me some. Trust me, they are great. Throw away your saggy underwear, people. Go to MeUndies.com slash BS and get 20% off your first order plus free shipping. Save even more when you buy a pack. They guarantee you'll be happy or your first pair is free. Once you feel MeUndies on your body, you're never going back. The Bill Simmons Podcast is also brought to you by HBO because they were nice enough to give me my own television show that launches next spring. Thank you, HBO. Newsflash, you don't need cable or satellite to watch HBO anymore. Just download the HBO Now app and start your free one-month trial today. Yeah. Uh, enough for you. All right. You know, when I think of West Coast rap, yeah. one of the first people I think of is Malcolm Gladwell. Can you pick <laughs> Can you sing that? How are you? I'm very well, very well. I love, I, I love that association. Yeah. <laughs> well, you had your gangster rap stage there a little bit right before the New Yorker, I remember. I did, you know, uh, when my, my long hair stage, totally, when I was, uh, but I was rocking more, much more of a kind of a West Indian vibe, you know, mm. than I was... Uh, a Snoop West Coast kind of thing. Um, so we have we have a lot to talk about, and in lot. fact, this is going to be an especially good podcast because you and I have not had like a long phone conversation. Sometimes we haven't talked in in a couple months, and and uh, normally that kind of steps on the podcast because then you're just repeating the same beats of the. But this is like a nice fresh conversation that we've needed to have for a little while anyway. So I'm excited. I know. Yeah, no, no, very. Uh, first of all. Well, we should talk about Grantland first. Let's just get that out of the way. You yeah. were, you were, um, what was your title when we launched Grantland? Founding contributing editor or something? I can't even remember. It was, uh, no, yeah, I think that's what it was. There was this Kosterman, me, who else? Jane Levy. Yeah. That's right. And that's John it. Walsh, the great John Walsh. The great I still John love Walsh. John Walsh. I will always love John Walsh. Nobody will ever be able to tear my love down for John Walsh. Uh, yeah, so you were, and you, we wrote a couple pieces together. You wrote a call. You wrote at least two pieces on your so, own. On my own, and then we did we did so many of those back and forth. Yeah, like four or five of them. Did some podcasts. So podcasts, and now it's all gone. Yeah, and I, and I didn't really give you a heads up over the last couple of months for where I, where I thought how I thought this was going to play out. So just like from a, as an outsider, just watching this, you're a busy guy. You don't know what's going on. Like, what was your reaction? It's insanity. I've never seen so. This a, a brand is created, a magazine is created that is fresh and new and edgy, and it has an incredibly loyal following. It's it has international recognition, and then they decide to shut it down. It's, I think you actually said this to me in an email. Do you know how hard it is to create a, a brand new uh, media brand today? It's pretty and hard. Then, it's pretty hard, and for them to kind of. Uh, for ESPN to kind of turn around and just say, well, and kind of flush it down the toilet, it's just bizarre to me. I don't know. I know, you know, the whole story. I don't know. I know, you know, what I read in the paper. So I don't know the backstory here, but, uh, it, it has, I was thinking about this and it's something I thought about ESPN for a long time. ESPN is a really weird institution. Yeah. On, on the one hand, it, cultivates this image of edginess, transgressiveness, youth-oriented bad boys, right? That was the whole Stuart Scott, Dan Patrick, the way they genuinely, I think, reinvent the culture of sports journalism, or at least of television sports journalism, in this really brilliant, fresh way. But every time they had, to, they had an opportunity to back that up, that edginess, that transgressiveness, they behaved like a bank. Like, they were... They were terrified. I mean, to me, the lesson of the whole fallout of Grantland is how terrified the bosses of ABC and Disney and ESPN were with controversy, which is bizarre because they're in the controversy business, right? Yeah. That, that's what you, what you try to do when you're in the business of sports journalism is generate discussion and controversy over something we're passionate about. Every time one of those opportunities pops up, they behave like they're Goldman Sachs, and you have, you know, criticized the managing director of equity research. You know, it's like, 
like, can I keep going here? Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm enjoying all of it. Keep going. Okay. So, like, for example, the whole thing about you and Goodell, yeah. right? So I don't know what happened, but I'm going to guess Roger Goodell got on the phone with the head of ABC and said... Probably Disney. It, Disney, Disney, right? And yeah. said, I'm very unhappy with what Simmons said about me on the show. Now, the, the, the appropriate response for whoever, whoever it was he called would be to say, Roger, I feel your pain. We have a big, you have a great partnership. I want nothing more than to be fair with you. Why don't you go on Simmons' podcast and defend yourself? That's called journalism. He's a robot. He never would have done that. I know, but, but I don't even care what he would have done. It. That's the appropriate response on the part of ESPN, right? Yeah. Is we're a journalistic organization. If you don't like the way you're treated, I'm offering you 45 minutes with Simmons to make your case. Right. And then the difficult phone call for them is they should have called you up and said, look, you don't have any choice. Goodell's coming on your show. And by the way, you would have said fantastic. Right. But instead, they acted like it was the Kremlin in 1948 and someone had criticized Stalin. Yeah. I, said, Wait, it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, there's two separate stories here. It's like, how did how did things get so bad? And then also what happened after I left? And I haven't really talked that much about either, but I will say like, it was an awesome place to work. You know, yeah. I, I think it's funny cause I haven't talked that much about ESPN since I left, but every time I've talked about it, I've always mentioned that I'm, I'm super grateful for all the stuff I was able to do there and the chances that I had to create things. Like I, I don't ever want anyone to think that I, that stuff wasn't super important to me. And I got to say, like, from 09, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, was a really good place to work, yeah. you know? And, like, like when Nate Silver was trying to decide what to do, um, and I was one of the people involved with courting him, and, it, and really it started because he came on my podcast after the election, and we were in the car, we went to lunch, we were just talking about stuff. And I could tell he didn't really know what he wanted to do. And I, at that point, I wanted him to write for Grantland. Yeah. And I thought there was a window open and we talked on and off for the next nine months. He talked to some other people at ESPN. He talked to David Cho, who uh, was working for me at the time and a couple of ESPN executives and my pitch to him over and over again. And people heard it, including when he was in San Antonio for the finals in 2013. And my dad hung out with him the whole day. And I was like, this is a great place to work. Like the ESPN gets a bad rap. It's actually a good place for a creative person to work. Which it was for those five years. And I think what happens yeah. with big companies. Oh, it, Can I know, point out? Yeah. In other contexts, if you were trying to woo someone to play for your team or work for you, you'd like you you give them strippers or, you know, <laughs> right. they hang out with Bono. You bring in your dad. <laughs> yeah, I, bring in, I brought in my 67-year-old dad to watch basketball with him. I thought that would, I thought that would get it. And, and obviously it worked because he signed. But <laughs> um you know, I thought it was the right place for him. Like I genuinely felt that way. And when Whitlock, yeah. his contract came up a little bit later, it was the same thing. We talked to him. I was like, yeah, I think you should have a column and be on PTI. But um, I think what happens with corporations a lot of times is people change. The people underneath the big boss changes. The big boss job changes. And it, you can have just enough shifting where things start to shift. And I'm not saying I was blameless with anything. I mean, yeah. you know, when, when I did that podcast with Goodell, we took stuff out of my podcast all the time. My whole my whole thing with the podcast was, you know, the third rail is sitting over there. You got to be really careful walking toward it. You don't want to touch it, but it's sometimes it's fun to get really close. And the good thing about podcasts is you can touch the rail. And if you realize that you touched it and you got electrocuted, you go, yeah, we should take that out. And yeah. we did that a bunch of times. And the irony of what happened with that podcast was, um, you know, when I did it, I was mad about a lot of stuff that was going on behind the scenes, which I don't need to talk about, but um, I was working my ass off. I was about to do a six hour taping session with Jalen Rose, right? Mm -hmm. Where we did our little NBA YouTube previews. So we were about to be in a studio for six solid hours doing our first 10 teams. I had done that podcast that day and I went right from the podcast to the studio to do six straight hours. And a couple of my people were texting me like, hey man, you wanna listen to that podcast before it goes up? Like. You know, you, you got pretty into that one. You just, eh, no, that's fine. Just, it's okay. Just go with it. And I never listened to it. If I'd heard, I would have said, you know what? That doesn't sound, I don't think that's worth it. 
I should we should take that. I would have taken it out. And, yeah, I. Uh, you know what? I I disagree. I don't think you should have had to. I don't think you should. That's the wrong impulse. The right impulse is that ESPN has to say it's sports. It's well, that's you're fair. talking about Roger Goodell, who is just a goofball who happens to run the league. I mean, we're not. It's not like you're you're criticizing the Pope here. It's fine to have a. And you, you were criticizing, you were bringing up that point in the context of a very legitimate argument about how the NFL treats its players in response to allegations of misconduct. Right. If you can't have free discussion about that, what's the point of being a sports journalism uh, network? Right. Oh, I mean, listen, like, I'm with you. I stand by everything I said about that guy. I thought he was yeah. lying. I was, I was born out correct. The guy did lie. He's either he's either dumb or a liar, and it's quite possible he's a little bit of both. I would yeah. I would say there's a continuum here, and I'm not sure whether he's more on the lying end or the dumb end, but I'm open to suggestion on it. But my you know my issue and the mistake I made and the thing that I feel really badly about is I had all these people that were counting on me. You know, yeah. I got 50 people working for that website in some capacity, full time, part time, and if if I'm going to push the envelope like I did. Um, first of all, you got to know where the line is because the last thing I want to do is put all those people in a bad spot. And then secondly, like just as a staff, we should have realized like, Hey, is this worth it? And, and that's something we should have held the podcast. We should have talked about it. We should have had a meeting about it. And I was in a room with Jalen for six hours and yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes you wonder, it's almost like when you watch a baseball game and somebody makes an error and they lose the game. Like David, like Daniel Murphy makes the error in the World Series, and you think like, well, that's an error. The game could have gone either way if he doesn't do that. And then the other hand, you think, well, maybe that error was a micro, was a symptom of something bigger, mm-hmm. you know. And in our case, I was overworked, and I should have listened to that podcast, and I was doing too many things, and we should have taken our time with it, and we didn't. But so that really set the tone for just a, a really bad next eight months and yeah, so that's one yeah. part of the story and it was always headed a certain way after they suspended me um but the, but the way they handled the website from the moment they decided they weren't going to re- renew my contract which i found out uh, about on twitter and which all of my staff found about on twitter every single person that worked for me and with me yeah. um all the way through what happened last week it was all the same issue it was the fact they didn't communicate with the staff They never made the staff was really scared for the future of the site. They were scared for where it was going. They didn't know who the, who the leader was in place of me. I mean, I hired every person that worked there. I was the guy, I was the person for lack of the better word, like, you know, the father figure almost. And the site was the site I came up with. And I was generating a lot of the ideas that led to what the site became and, and then delegating to all these people that had hired. And we had like this awesome, awesome thing. And you can't just change that in a minute. You know, there's going to be ramifications, repercussions. If you do change it, then you have to make people feel good about how it played out. And they just didn't. And from the get go, you know, they acted very corporate about it. People found out about the new editor in chief on Twitter for the most part. I think only 25% of the staff knew in the moment, everybody else found out after the fact. And when you, when you handle things that way, it goes from there. You know, and so your point about a corporation and how a corporation handles things, this was the perfect example of it. They handled it like a corporation from May on. And and that's the thing is like, it was a really creative company. It didn't always used to be like that. And to me, that, that was the part I think I lost. Yeah. No, it's a, listen, it's a shame. I mean, I, I, I make these criticisms from a position of love as well. No, you know, I spent half an hour at least a day on ESPN.com or related sites for the last God knows how many years. I mean, you know, like millions of sports fans, I have a tangible investment in this, in this uh, network, in this brand, whatever it is. And it's just sad to see them betray their own legacy, you know? Yeah. And at the same time, you know, they did own it and they can do what they want with it. I think, the thing that was frustrating to me and especially, you know, people wrote so many n- nice things about the site and I appreciate all of it. Uh, it was really nice to, to know that the site resonated with so many people and they were sad about it. We were sad too. It was, you know, just an awful weekend. Really, really, really yeah. sad. It was, and 
something that I think from the moment Wesley, Wesley was the first one who left and Wesley was a huge part of the site and not both on the site and behind the scenes. And when he left and then Rembert was leaving and then Jacoby was basically going to go do his radio show and the site just started to splinter and you could feel it. But I didn't think it was going to be overnight, you know? He, I mean, I was still working there six months ago. Yeah. You know? <laughs> you think of it that way. And and the site had just come off its best month ever in April. We literally had our best month. And yeah. we were still figuring out how to do the site. I think that's another thing people forget. Mm -hmm. I knew that the moment something bad happened or if I left or whatever, I knew that the rhetoric would spin that the site didn't make enough money. But, yeah. you know... They made, no magazine has ever made money in its first two or three years. Right? I know. Well, Always. that's true, but we, we should have made a lot more money than we did. And part of this is my fault because I always felt like, uh, listen, just worry about the words. The people are going to come. Worry about the quality. Mm -hmm. I, I, like I the, the staff can back me up. I never looked at the page view stuff. Like I never cared about that. I didn't care that so-and-so's piece did, uh, X amount of traffic compared to this, another person's piece. Like I always was worried about the overall calibration and quality of the site. And I felt like in the long run, we were going to win. But then when the business stuff started and we need to keep growing the site and they're like, look, you know, the site's not, it's, it's not really raking in the cash. And I'm like, that's not possible. We, we have like the best advertising demo there is. This doesn't make sense. Explain this to me. Uh, yeah. it was, it was really amazing. Like we had a sponsor, we had a sponsored studio that wasn't sponsored. Remember that state of the art studio? I think you were in there, right? In LA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We never had a sponsor for it. So like, how hard right. is it to get a sponsor? Sports nation has a sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really? Nobody, nobody's available to sponsor this. So it was a lot of moments like that. And you would have thought bill with all that you've done for the Boston sports teams over the years, Dunkin donuts, you could have, you could have gotten, yeah. Well, anything from Boston. Yeah. Uh, uh, any of those seafood. local ads <laughs> Jordan's furniture could have done it yeah you're right uh, so it was frustrating I mean it's funny because people have been writing this about that that it was a different kind of story but really it was a story it was a business story and it was a story about uh, ESPN which is built to sell really big things I've said this before like they get 125 million from Dunkin Donuts and they spread that out on college football and Monday night football and sports center and all these different things. They never, we never really fit into that. You know, yeah. we were like a, this little boutique place that's trying to build traffic and, and trying to give them a little bit of soul. And yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, you almost have to think out of the box to sell something like that. Right. Yeah. Well, they have to, I mean, the challenge for them is they have to remain the freshest and the smartest voice in sports journalism if they're going to stay on top. And that requires investments, right? That requires doing strange and unusual things. And that requires tolerating some dissident voices from time to time. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know whether they ever, they were willing to kind of, that requires that you, sometimes you pay a little price in terms of your, you know, corporate image uh, to get to keep that difficult position as the smartest and freshest. That's what I don't know. I said, it's a bit easy to give in to the, uh, uh, to the banker's mentality and say, we've got to be bland and corporate and all speak with one voice. Or you go the other way and you just go, what are we? We're a company that shows games and, and sports center. And those are the two things that are the most important things to us. You know, a lot of the decisions that were made were always financial over creative at that place. Like for instance, and I, I made a big deal of this cause I went on Mike Francesa's show last month. Mm -hmm. I was really excited to go on that show. I love Mike Francesa. And it never made sense to me why I wasn't allowed to go on that show or like the best show in Boston or some of these local shows that weren't affiliated with ESPN because it's good for me to go on Mike Francesa's show and kill it on his show, right? All, yeah. I, he is the guy in New York City. If I'm on that show and I do a good job, all that does is bring maybe mm -hmm. a couple more people from New York to you me. Were, you were prohibited from... from Doing stuff outside the ESPN family? Oh yeah, nobody, nobody from ESPN was allowed to do radio shows outside of ESPN unless you got special permission. And usually, you could get it if like you were promoting a book or something. But yeah, I wasn't allowed to go on Francesca's show. I wasn't allowed to go on any Boston station that wasn't affiliated with ESPN. It's like Boston was my place. You know, that's where I had the most fans. That's where I grew up. That's where I wrote about the teams the most. And 
to not be able to go on there and kind of, for lack of a better word, like, you know, kind That's of still weird. control like, my brand is a good thing. It's not like, it's like not the Berlin Wall, but the Bristol Wall. A little bit. Well, <laughs> all right. But from their side, think of it this way. They're trying to build a giant business with ESPN Radio, right? Yeah. So their attitude was, we're paying our talent all this money to to work for us. Why are we then helping competitors we have in different markets when part of the draw for ESPN Radio is that, you know, we have these people and they come on our shows, mm -hmm. which is fine. But then that means I have to go on those shows. So... There are only a couple of ESPN radio shows. Like in the last 15 years, I like I like Coward Show. I used to go on Coward Show every once in a while. I went yeah. on Rosillo and SVP. I went on Levitard Show a bunch of times. Yeah. But I didn't want to go on Mike and Mike Show. So that means I can never go on a morning show ever? Yeah. That's yeah. that's a, just a weird... Like imagine HBO saying you can only go on shows that are Time Warner. Yeah. And that's it. Like really? Lena yeah. Dunham can't do an interview with anyone other than Time Warner? Yeah. So, but that goes back to your point about the corporate thing, and um, yeah, you get you get you have to you can't get too caught up in those kind of uh, corporate games if you want to be a serious journalistic force. You know what I mean, it's just like a. It's, but maybe maybe the lesson of this is next time you start something like Grandland, you can't start it at the big company. You gotta you have to go independent or find someone who's scrappier and a little more willing to take chances. I mean that's. Maybe that's the kind of sad truth of this. Uh, it's sad. It happened. I have like a half an hour hole in my day now. I don't know what I'm going to do without Zach Lowe in the NBA season. I'm already like I'm going through Zach Lowe's separation anxiety. Well, and I think that the thing they asked, underestimated probably was the culture of the site and that people were pretty close and the relationships. And, you know, we, we were always a little understaffed, which is just the way it is. But... Mm -hmm it's easier to get people to work harder than usual when they really believe in the site and they believe in everybody that works yeah. for it. And when they're also competitive, I mean, I'm sure you have that at the New Yorker where you, you have unbelievable writers at the New Yorker and it raises your game, you know, cause you're like, yeah. I gotta be good. Yeah. I got, we have this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. And I, I'm not, I can't, I gotta spend the extra three hours on this piece. Cause you know, I'm going to be in this issue with these people and we had that and we had people that really raised their games and it was, you know, I don't think anybody expected what was going to happen, mm -hmm. uh, last weekend, but it was, I think it did help that, that so many people wrote nice things about the site and yeah, yeah, all that stuff. And so. by, I mean, I'm sure people like Zach Lowe and Barnwell, I'm, I'm guessing will be kept on by the main ESPN. I think site. a lot of them will. Yeah. I yeah. think they're going to make an effort. I just to... hope we get to read them in the same way and at the same length. The only uh, thing I, the, the one thing I didn't like is they tried to make it seem like, uh, you know, when I hired a couple of people from Grantland, I hired three editors and Juliet, who wasn't an editor. And, uh, it, it was, it was, the message was being massaged out there that this killed the site. And it was like, it was, you can't, they gave two weeks notice. Like if you're committed to a site, you can't replace three editors, no matter how good they were. Yeah, you know yeah. that 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 just to me it seems totally disingenuous, and I personally think that that you know when you read that the site they had agreed to site shut the site down a week before they actually announced it, then uh, I don't know, kind of speaks for itself. You, you three editors leave behind the scenes plus Juliet who wasn't an editor, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. Dan Fairman leaves concurrently. But now, but now that's when you realize you have to shut down the site. It's disingenuous. Yeah, I don't yeah. believe it for a second. I think, I think uh, it was what it was. Hold on, we got to hook up our friends at Audible.com. Do you love books, but find that you never have time to read them? Well, Audible.com has the perfect solution. Get audiobooks, listen to them at the gym, during your commute, or even as you're watching football on mute. Audible.com provides over 180,000 audio programs from leading book publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, even business information providers. Their free app works on iPhones, iPad, Android, Windows, Kindle Fire, and over 500 MP3 players. Also, you own these books. You're not renting them. You can access them anytime you want. 
Audible.com has created the great listen guarantee. If you don't like a book, no worries. Just exchange it for another title. No questions asked. Why listen to sports radio and lousy music channels when you can listen to books? Right now, Audible.com is offering a free 30-day trial membership. It includes one audiobook of your choice. Go to audible.com slash BS to start your free trial today. What else do we have to talk about? So much, Bill. I feel we've gotten that enormous uh, issue off our chest. Let's talk to <laughs> Milwaukee Bucks Stadium deals. So this is, I said I wanted to talk about this, and it still sticks in my craw. You know what makes me angry about this? is I feel like there, this whole issue blew up in August. And when I say blew up, it didn't blow up. It was like a couple stories here and there, a great story in Grandland, and then it went away. But here you have two of the wealthiest people in the United States, two hedge fund guys, right? Wes Edens and uh, Mark Lasry, buy the bucks and basically hold this, go to the state, Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, and do the same thing everyone always does, which is we're going to move to Seattle or Las Vegas unless you build us a stadium. And they get a deal that is probably worth half a billion dollars from the Wisconsin taxpayers. So, you know, we've heard the story a million times, right? But that does not, I feel we've heard it so many times, the obscenity of it has now started to diminish. It's not registering the way it should. I mean, just to recap, two guys who are collectively worth probably north of $10 billion <laughs> go around and go to a state that has a deficit. Running a deficit is running out of so much money they, they cut $250 million from the University of Wisconsin's budget. They go to that state and say, unless you give us half a billion, we're leaving. And they get a commitment of, I mean, the deal they got was so lopsided. Not only is the state giving them this big bond issue and all kinds of other things, the state didn't even ask to, for any share of naming rights. They get a, so the state essentially builds the stadium and then gives up the $120 million that's coming in naming rights to these two guys who are worth between them $10 billion. I mean, this is... How is it we are in a, in a first of all? How is it that we are in a position right now in America where this can happen, and we're just we're over it? We can't even muster any kind of outrage. Or are we really that cynical now about the interaction of wealth and privilege and professional sports? And second is my second thing is where is where is where is the leadership on this from the people running these leagues, right? At what point do the people running the baseball, basketball, football stand up and say, all right, from now on, everyone take a pledge, no more public money? Is it, is it really that hard for, you know, Goodell or for anyone to make that? That would do so much for the integrity of the game, so much to kind of suggest to the fan base that they're, the teams that they are passionate about, that they follow, are concerned with more than simply what happens on the field, have some concern about, uh, you know, the, the communities in which they play in. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, why am I, why is, why did we just let this pass without getting genuinely angry? I have a couple of thoughts. One is that if it was such a good business deal for the city, why didn't the two rich billionaires want to do it? That's a red flag, right? It's yeah. a great deal for you guys. Yeah, you yeah. should do it. Well, why aren't you doing it? Uh, that's one. Second is, you know, John Oliver tackled some of this on, on his show a few months ago, and I thought the part that he missed and the crucial part of this whole discussion is the NBA has Seattle as its extortion city. That's right, yeah. And it's like, right. like the NFL for 30 years used Los Angeles as its extortion city. And anytime somebody was th was thinking about moving to LA, all of a sudden, whoa, look at this. We're getting money for the new stadium now. And that and that's how they used it. And now Seattle, which when you think about it, it makes no sense at all that Seattle doesn't have a basketball team. It's, I would say, one of the eight biggest markets when you consider. Um, yeah. I, I don't think it's eight biggest market in population, but I would say top six or seven in terms of the amount of wealth that would fill the court sides and the suites and the mm. at local advertising with all the Seattle businesses and internet stuff and all the stuff going on there. You want a team in Seattle. Yeah. They don't have yeah. a team team got taken with the Oklahoma city 
which was the, the biggest disgrace of Stern's entire tenure other than 2002 game six Kings Lakers. But uh, they never get another team and now they're the extortion city. And I actually think I was anti-expansion for a long time. But I actually think we almost have enough players now where we could go to 32 teams. We have, there's enough good players in the league now yeah. where you could do it and you can give Seattle the expansion team. But in the meantime, people like the Bucks owners get to extort the local play. And you, I did, did you mention the part where they they were smart enough to make a couple like powerful local Wisconsin oh, right. slash oh, Milwaukee yeah. people like very small minority owners of the team? Exactly. Spread the cash around. I mean, no, I mean, on a certain sense, I don't blame them, that these are guys who have gotten where they are in business because they seize every opportunity, and they understand that you, because of the way the league is structured and the, the fact that there is this small child in Seattle that's been kidnapped and is, and is, and is used as, as a means of extorting cash out of local communities, you can play this game. You can get someone to chip in half a, million, half a billion dollars to help you build a stadium. But I'm wondering where their shame is. Like... And why, and why doesn't Silver just stand up and say, we now have a situation where, for goodness sake, the Dolans are getting taxpayer money, they're getting taxpayer subsidies for Madison Square Garden. The Dolans who are, comma, the Dolans, comma, billionaires, comma, who own one of the uh, most lucrative franchises in the world yeah. are getting a bailout from the taxpayers of New York City. At a certain point, why doesn't Silver just say, come on, guys, we can't persist and persist in earning the goodwill of our fan base if we behave like assholes yeah it's right? that's what this is about it's just about don't be an asshole you have a owning the milwaukee bucks is really really fun it's a privilege that almost no one in the world no basketball fan in the world gets to exercise enjoy it you know have all the fun you want but don't make the taxpayers of milwaukee subsidize your little uh your, your your little hobby. I mean, it's just like it's obscene. Well, and also, I can see it if it's Sacramento, right? Because if Sacramento loses the Kings, which they almost did, mm -hmm. now what's their identity? Their identity is like the governor lives there. But, it, you know, that was their team, and that was the, yeah. the, that was the... It's almost like when Hartford lost the Whalers. It's not almost like it. It is like it. When Hartford lost the Whalers... Then they're, they're way closer to New Haven and Bridgeport than they want to be. When they had the yeah. Whalers, they had a team in one of the four sports, you know? And so if Milwaukee loses the Bucks, whatever, no, no. they but still have the Packers and they still have the, the Brewers. No, no, here's the thing, Bill. The, those are two separate issues. What I, want, what I want is for Silver and Goodell to stand up and say, there is always going to be this tension um, with small market teams where the owners are going to want to move to a more like lucrative market. There's, there's no way we can get rid of that. That's called the marketplace. We have to deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. But we have to stop the practice of using that uncertainty over small market teams as a way of looting the pocketbook of local taxpayers. That's what I'm saying. Have this argument about sac whether, whether the Kings belong in Sacramento or the Bucks belong in Milwaukee. Fine. But do not use it as a way to get half a billion out of – by the way, out of the state that's running a deficit of two point two billion dollars last year. Well, we never even mentioned the real the real part here is that nobody has ever really been able to prove. There's been exceptions, but for the most part, the whole the mindset of well, it's going to create so many jobs and so much money for the for the eco local economy here. It's it's a pretty dubious argument, really and dubious. especially with the Olympics, which has shot that argument in the foot over and over again. But yeah. You know, I look at, so here's a good example of where this actually might have worked. In L.A., they create the Staples Center, L.A. Live. They create this whole area in downtown that between the two basketball teams, the hockey team, the concerts, they have all these other businesses. There's 15 restaurants there. Uh, they have a whole bunch of other stuff. And downtown was, you never wanted to go down there 10 years ago. It was the place that the Clippers and Lakers played in, in the Kings and you just kind of got out of there as fast as possible. Now downtown LA is, is really heading in a good direction. There's a lot of good bars and restaurants. There's all these living places that are going down there. Could that have happened without this? I don't know, but LA yeah. Live really helped. And I think that's, a, that's an argument in case of, yes, this is where it works. Boston's maybe the flip side. 
they tear down the garden. They build, they build uh, the new garden basically. And they're saying it's going to invigorate that whole area and do a whole bunch of things. And then, you know, I was there for a Celtic game in April. It still feels like the same place. I mean, the tunnel, the, the, I, the mass pike thing is gone. The highway, which, which I 90, I can't even remember which one. I-93. I can't remember, uh, Bill. You've been gone I've been Boston. gone 13 years. I can't even remember what highway it was. That's heartbreaking. You know, people in Boston listening right now, you, you broke like a million hearts. I, he's, I, forgo no. he's forgotten our interstate. That's not fair because I call <laughs> my daughter my son's name and vice versa 10 times a day. So that's I'm just old. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I think that was a case where maybe it didn't invigorate that area as much as maybe they thought. But it, it seems to be really hit or miss. And the yeah, argument... It, it, the economic studies suggest that the economic, the, the, the kind of economic bounce that you're alleged to get from building a stadium rarely materializes. There are some exceptions, but where there is an exception, it, that argues even more strongly against public investment. In other words, if the, if the stadium, if there is a case where the stadium is a clear-cut uh, home run in terms of bringing, uh, revitalizing an area, then the owner should be quite happy to pay for it himself, right? He can benefit from, he can yeah. open lots of bars. He can open a, a restaurant, you know, and hotel complex next door. He can do all these things to benefit from his own investment if it's such a good one. Um, totally agree. It's, and then it's, it's, it's crazy. We didn't even mention, like, you know, you talked about the NFL and the NBA. I think, I think the NFL guys are just wired a little differently than these NBA guys. You know, the NBA guys they it's it's a little bit more of an ego purchase from you get to sit courtside get to yeah. own a team the guys are so marketable it's a league that's going up it's it's now starting to get in that financial stratosphere that the nfl guy the nfl is like old school fu money you know yeah. it's just really 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 rich old powerful guys yeah and and if it's not rich, old, powerful guys, it's a younger guy who got handed the team by his rich, old, powerful dad. And yeah. the way they operate is on a different plane than the NBA. I, I think they're much more cutthroat. And the deals yeah. they make and just everything they do feels... They're a lot more conservative. I mean, I think it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a uh, the NBA crowd is a lot more impressive in terms of sort of... Uh, how smart they are, how innovative they are. A little out of the box, yeah. Well, yeah. And, except for your friend Vivek, who's, no, no, who's no, wait out of the box. I, I, want, I want to defend Vivek. <laughs> no, please do. Please defend Vivek. Want... We're making a first. <laughs> this is a first in podcast history. Look, here's, my, here's the case for Vivek. Now, I, I, I say I, you call him my friend. I know, I've known Vivek a while. I wrote about him in my book. You had a whole chapter. A whole chapter, whole chapter. Here's the thing about Vivek. One, Vivek, a very, very smart guy all right now keep that in mind what is going on right now in sacramento is he is going through the learning process of what it means to be a successful owner why do you expect him to work it out in two years how long you just went you just went on for half an hour about how it took a long time to understand what Grandland was and how to make it a success you had a learning curve as one does when one is starting a new and complicated enterprise but Vac is going through his learning curve Vladi Divac is an experiment on the way to successful MBA management. Tate, right? my producer, is laughing right now. He's <laughs> literally snickering. It's hilarious. Keep going, though. <laughs> no, look, come back to me. You're just in a hurry and you're impatient. Vivek has taken the long view. Come back to me in three years' time, and we'll have a discussion about how good a owner he is. At the moment, he's figuring it out. By the way, can I just say, Bill Simmons, that if I handed you the Boston Celtics tomorrow, you cannot tell me you wouldn't have a period of two years where you went insane. Um, I've read all your columns on the trade, the, the trade machine. You'd make a thousand trades in the first 12 months. Admit it. Admit it. You would. Uh, before I give my response, yeah. I wanted to say hi to our old friend Stamps.com. How great would it be if this post office was open 24-7? Well, breaking news, it is. At stamps.com, you can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter or package using your own computer and printer. And even better, Malcolm, if you sign up for stamps.com and use the promo code BS, you get a four-week trial plus a $110 bonus offer that includes postage and a digital scale. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at top of the homepage, 
and type in BS. That's stamps.com, enter BS. Here's my Vivek response. We've seen new MBA owners yeah. struggle that first year. I call it new owner syndrome. Yeah. I actually, I came up with one of my dumb phrases for it. You saw it with Joe Lacob. You saw yeah. it with Wick Grossbeck. You saw all these guys. They take over a team. They think they're the dude. They think they're the smartest guy. They, their chest puffing out. And uh, They spend too much time with the trade machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then about a year and a half later, after they get punched in the face a couple times by bad moves or bad judgment or whatever, that's when they realize, oh, okay, I got to start delegating more. Maybe, yeah. I, maybe I need a better team around me. Maybe it is important to have a, a basketball savvy front office guy. And, you know, it changes for different people. Now, you talk about Vivek's learning curve. Vivek hired a guy who wasn't really not involved in the NBA for the last 10 years, but also wasn't living in the United States. He <laughs> <laughs> was living in like Belgrade. Uh, <laughs> didn't really have the reservoir of like, I think if you ask Vlade who played in the 2008 finals, I don't know what his answer would be. So it was an eccentric choice, but I'm sure Vivek had his reasons. By the way, I'm going to go back to you. You take over the Boston Celtics. First of all, you you go insane on the trade machine. Then I, who no, do you I, hire? You you hire you hire like House to be your general manager. Who could knows? I what the, could I get House? <laughs> Are you positive I could get him? I, w I would absolutely hire House. <laughs> I'm just saying you'd make some eccentric choices too. The half of the half of the management of the of the new Simmons led Boston Celtics would be graduates of Holy Cross between like 1985 and 1995. That's not going to look a little suspicious to an outsider. Then I, you'd settle down. Yeah, I mean, I am the same guy who was in charge of a site that was probably worth over 100 million dollars and now doesn't exist. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm the wrong person to ask. Yeah, I don't sure what you should be giving lessons to yeah. the fact. But so I do that, think I do think though, like the stuff I've heard about the Kings, yeah. It, I mean the draft stories. Yeah, yeah. About I mean, like he thought he was getting Mario Hazonia or, or Kristaps Porzingis at six, and they weren't there, and everybody just kind of looked at each other confused, and he didn't want to take Emmanuel Mudiay at six because he hadn't worked out with them, so he took Willie Cauley Stein. Just took him at six. Wasn't wasn't probably going in the top ten. Just grabbed him. Was good with okay. that one. It just like that is just bad management. You just take Moody and you figure it out. He's the best asset. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, stuff no. like that or that. What about when he traded Stauskas, who was the eighth pick last year, to clear cap space to sign Wesley Matthews, who then signed with Dallas. That was a problem. Gave a, gave away a couple picks there. Like th this is like basic NBA one on one stuff that they're screwing up. And Vivek's been there longer than two years now, so I I think he people should be concerned. No, I I I am a little more patient than you. I say You're very give patient. time. He's got to you got to make all of these mistakes once. The question is, do you make them a second time? Well, back, when he but, makes when it, time comes for that second round of mistakes, let's evaluate them. Back to the original topic though about uh, yeah. about stadiums and stuff. As you said, this just keeps happening over and over again. And I think people know it's wrong, but nobody really cares. And why does nobody care? That's well, nobody saying. cares because ultimately it's the same thing like with boxing. Nobody, boxing's kind of lawless. Stuff just happens. People make up their own rules in boxing. Like you, you could fail a drug test or you could show up, you could show up uh, five pounds overweight for your fight. And they decide, well, the title's not going to be at stake, but you're still going to fight, which is crazy. If you're if you're 140, if you're 143 pounds, and and we're supposed to fight at 143, and I show up on that way 150, yeah, and they say, well, you're still going to fight, but the belt's not at stake. Like, who has an advantage, me or you? So, <laughs> it's just lawless, and I and the stadium it, stuff is just as lawless to me. And it, I know, and, but our, here, the difference is our money's not at stake in the same way in boxing, right? We accept the fact boxing is the, is the, the crazy lawless transgressive sport. Right. They're doing something they shouldn't be doing, right? We all know that. They're beating each other over the head repeatedly, which is a little bit crazy in right. respect. The thing about it that bothers me about, uh, but that's, that stays within the realm of sport. The thing about stadiums is it's sports that's bleeding out into areas where sports has no business belonging, and that is in raiding the public purse and taking money away from much more important things, right? Like education and like in the case of, 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 uh, of Wisconsin, the exact same week 
uh, or one month after Scott Walker signed the bill giving the Bucks those many hundreds of millions of dollars, he took two hundred and fifty million dollars out of the budget of the of the University of Wisconsin. I mean, it's like that. Well, it's, it's education. I mean, who cares? <laughs> oh, it'll be fine. It's, we have enough educated people. We don't need we need a lot more. I, but I think like. All right, you've heard me talk about the concept of a sports czar before, and it would be a weird way to spend federal resources, and it would be a weird person to have in Obama's cabinet along with people who were in charge of things that actually mattered. But at the same time... We need a, no, I, I'm, all, I'm all over the sports czar. And we, and we have talked about this. We, we have a back and forth somewhere in my archives that have probably been destroyed by now that, uh, <laughs> about the need for a sports czar, but... I just think there's so much money at stake in sports you know, year to year. Sports. And, and there's so many different things like this Milwaukee Stadium thing where we clearly need somebody who's in charge of things and we don't yeah. have it. And that's I don't that's why I don't think anything will change until that's somebody's job to help change that. You know who should be the sports star? Who? Obama. Oh, that's his, an unbelievable his, job for him. His time, his time as president is nearly up. In Obama, we have... I think the most serious sports fan we've had in quite a long time. Yeah. I mean, Nixon was a pretty big sports fan. Uh, obviously, Gerald Ford was an All-American, but I don't know. I think he was a football guy. I mean, Obama's a serious, knows a lot about basketball. And by the way, as far as I can tell, is a, uh, is a very good basketball player himself. I mean, he's not an elite level basketball player, but I think he's good. I think he's I think he's uh, stepped down a little bit. I talked to him recently about something and uh and he said he he wasn't really playing anymore cuz he was too old. He was afraid know, but of getting I'm hurt. saying is he's got the yeah, But now he's he his mid 50s. Yeah, I mean he had an unbelievable run. He's such a big basketball fan that um I like I think he watches hardwood classics on NBA TV and stuff. Like he'll bang out like the old Jordan versus the Knicks in '92 type of moment on the really. treadmill at five in the morning. So yeah, I'm with you. He's the perfect he was, he was sportsman. At the Bulls, he was at the Bulls home opener. Has has any president? At, not only did I see him in that Bulls opener, but he even got interviewed. Has any president ever had more post presidency options than Obama? I feel like there's yeah, 47 it, yeah. jobs in play for him, including. So many. Uh, yeah, I mean he could he could run ESPN maybe. He really. <laughs> <laughs> to bring the conversation full circle, he, um, if I was the NFL, I would say, uh, here we have a... Name your price. Here, yeah, here we have a league, which is the most valuable sports league in North America, one of the most valuable in the le leagues in the world, and it's being run by a buffoon. How can we get legitimate in a hurry? Yeah. I mean, call up Barry. Barry O. He's your man. Let me tell you right? something. Barry's listening for $44 million a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Goodell made. He made forty-four million dollars. I know it's unbelievable. Yeah, I they, that number when that came out, I think that got the attention of every powerful person who was not making at least fifteen million dollars a year. I think yeah, all of them were like, like, "Wait, what? How much does he make?" There should be okay. So this is let's call this the Simmons the Simmons stat, which is the ratio of your IQ to the amount of money you make. Do you, <laughs> why, why is it named after me? That feels insulting. <laughs> Because it came up in a conversation with you, I think. Do you think that still feels that, insulting? That, 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 that Goodell has the highest Simmons number ever recorded. Why is it a Simmons number? Can it just be the Goodell number? Okay, it's called the Goodell after number. Goodell. It's the Goodell number. I think it's called the Goodell number because it's inconceivable that anyone could have a higher ratio than him. Well. The biggest red flag with him, and it's a red flag just in general, and I'm not saying this is always the case. There's been people who have succeeded who have been legacy kids, but the legacy kid thing always scares me. Yeah. And he is somebody whose dad was a rich and powerful guy. Yeah. And all right, so what does that mean? Well, first of all, that means rich and powerful people are working all the time. Maybe not maybe not thrown in as much parenting as normal. That's a possibility. Um, it's always dangerous to just hand somebody every break or yeah. tell them it's all going to work out no matter how. I, I mean, I, I would say a lot of the problems we've had in American history could be traced back to legacy kids or maybe yeah. some of the problems. I mean, it, just ask Knicks fans. Have you enjoyed your legacy kid, Jim yeah. Dolan, running the Knicks <laughs> exactly. these last 20 exactly. years? James uh, Dolan, my friend, is poster child. Dude, I wonder what Dolan's Goodell number is. Uh, Dolan, it I might be the Dolan number. 
Is maybe it's the Dolan number. Thing is, does Dolan? It's complicated because he doesn't draw a salary in the same way Goodell does. But you could work out what his annual compensation is. And I don't know who's dumber between the two of them. It is, man. That is a that's a horse race between. That's a race to the bottom between those two. It's a horse shit race. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The legacy kid thing though, it can go another way too, where. They they have kind of an attitude about people thinking it's been handed to them, which can go yeah. equally terribly. Yeah, I yeah. Think How dare I think you? That's the don't, don't I think that the that dysfunction be Goodell. of Goodell and the dysfunction of Dolan are quite separate. Yeah, uh, I think that Dolan is has exactly what you described: a chip on his shoulder over the suspicion, correct as it turns out, that he was handed like the world on a silver platter. Yeah. He hates the fact that people think that about him. But, but, Whereas but Goodell, it's a 100% fact. Which is 100% fact. But I think Goodell, I think his, his whole deal, his psychology is a little different. I think he's, he's the, remember that famous line about uh, George Bush Jr. that, or George Bush Sr. from Molly Ivins who said, I think it was Molly Ivins, that he was uh, born on third base and thought he hit a triple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The best. That's the Goodell thing. I yeah. think he genuinely believes he's a man of accomplishment. And that he got everywhere. He's, you know, he came up from the bottom himself. He's deluded as opposed to being uh, bitter, which is what, uh, which is the particular uh, James Dolman. Dolman. Well, and that's why I really loved with Goodell. I loved the whole argument in that outside the lines piece by Dan Van Atta and uh, I think Seth Wickersham. I can't remember the other writer, but uh, the whole concept of Goodell screwing up with Spygate and destroying the tapes. Yeah, and then for the next. Seven up. years, all the other rich owners who are all a holes to begin with, just just feeling like he was Kraft's boy. Yeah, and you know Kraft helped them with Kraft helped do every revenue deal that Goodell did basically for the first, and they were super tight. Yeah, and at some point the other owners really genuinely felt like Goodell was in the bag for Kraft, and he knew it. He knew yeah. these rich guys were like, nah. Go ahead, yeah, but what, how, what, did, when you roll over at night, is Kraft next to you? And they're making these little side jokes. And then this whole deflate gate thing happened. And all he did was want to prove to everybody that he wasn't Kraft's boy. Watch this. Oh, I'll show you. I'm going to take a first round pick from him. And But that's like a total legacy kid thing. Yeah. That's like yeah. just this loser's mentality of, of caring what everybody else thinks. Now all of a sudden you're in this ridiculous, like really... We, I don't think we talked on a podcast about this. Like, did you have a take on Deflategate? Oh, just that it was every time we learned something new, it got more ridiculous. Yeah. It's one of those rare cases where you sometimes think that as new revelations come out, it will resolve the controversy. You'll have a deeper understanding. This was the opposite. Every time I learned something new, it's like, wait, it's just like stupider and dumber. And that, the Wells Committee report, such as it was, was a piece of astonishing garbage yeah i mean just because a report is produced at great cost by a fancy sounding law firm and a lawyer with a long reputation does not mean it clarifies the issues or represents an intelligent intelligent and thoughtful analysis of the issues that report was just bullshit i mean it's just like it's just like a, ordered up by the nfl's office to cover their disastrous decisions yeah it was that whole thing was something. I mean, it was great for the Patriots because you win the championship and then you actually have a stick up your ass about the next season, which doesn't really yeah. happen. And we were seeing it now with the Warriors. Yeah. The Warriors yeah. are, have been out of their minds this first week because they've talked themselves into this narrative. And don't think Steve Kerr hasn't been pushing this down their throats all the time. I don't care that we won the championship. Nobody thinks we deserved it. Everybody thinks we we're lucky. Nobody and believes in us. Nobody believes in us. <laughs> Everybody says we're lucky. Everybody, go here. Hey, I have another story about how lucky we were. And he's just been feeding that and pushing them with a cattle prattle for the entire training camp, even though he's been hurt. Like he's been in and out. He had back issues. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. but I think he's developed this mentality in those guys that they have something to prove. And that's yeah. what happened with this Patriots team, too. I don't, it's not like you need extra incentive to play a football game and, and hit people at 30 miles an hour, but, um, but there is an edge to this Pats team in this whole season that I, I you know, if they you just won. This, well, how do you I mean, feel about this Pats? Put this Pats team in perspective of the in the the Brady era. Where do you? How good do you think this team is? So, the first ten games of the 017 that ended up losing the Super Bowl is the best Patriots team of all time. Yeah, that that team was. 
I think the greatest football team of all time. And then Sammy Morris got hurt. And even though he wasn't that good, it was like they didn't have a running game after that. The ex the the weight of the season wore them down and, and the Super Bowl was just all these different events that just you know, I'll say the perfect team to play them. I think the team was burned out. They had a bad game plan. They didn't get any fight. It was bad luck and bad everything. Um, but I think that was the best team. I think out of all the Super Bowl teams, the 04 team was the, the third Super Bowl team was probably the best one because Brady was really close to being Brady at that point. And yeah. their defense was really good. They ripped through the first couple games. The Eagles Super Bowl was a little unsatisfying. It, 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 that should have been the cherry in the Sunday of people just talking about how awesome they were. But remember, they won 21 straight games or 27. I don't even remember how many in a row they won. 23? Yeah. 21. Tate, look that up for me. Um, they they had a streak. They broke the record for consecutive wins. So that has to be the best team, right? Yeah. Uh, but this team, the difference now with Brady is the way the sport has changed. Even though he's old, he's he just goes to the line and he knows what to do every play. I've never seen anything like it. You know, he's, he yeah. just goes. He's like, oh, you guys are gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. Like it's almost like he's reached some Tom Cruise Thetan Seven level of quarterback Scientology well, play. This is the most eloquent defense against the charge they stole signals, which is actually, look at Brady. Like, maybe what you thought was stealing signals was actually just a really, really, really intelligent, well-prepared quarterback. Well, and, and more and more prepared every year. They was 21 straight, it says. But I see you see it with Manning, too. And Manning is actually like the more ravaged version of Brady, right? Where yeah. he's just physically on his last legs and I don't, can only I don't, make certain throws anymore. I saw that game this weekend against the, the Packers. Packers game. And he, his arm did not look, his arm looked fine to me. It looked, it's making, looked better than it did in the beginning of the season. He was making plays down the field. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think that, that answers the question. I, I think the issue with him is he's not a, not consistent week to week or more importantly, not consistent over the course of the season. Well, and he may not be able to keep that up. And that's the thing people need to remember with old quarterbacks because we saw that with Favre and you see that Marino and all these guys when they hit a certain point, they can still get there. It's just that they can't get there game after game after game. And it was like ties into like, I remember having great talks with Steve Nash about this and he hit this with his finish line. Like he could have played basketball at a really high level once a week. He just yeah. couldn't do it three times a week, you know? And yeah. I think for a quarterback... The difference is if when Manning has a bad week, it's going to happen on the wrong week. It's going to happen in January when it's 20 degrees or whatever. I think Brady's a little more foolproof, but Brady's been so unbelievable. The, the real guy that is the guy that is the guy that makes this go and is other than Brady, the best Patriot, I think of all time, other than Brady and maybe John Hanna is Gronkowski. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think he's unequivocally the best tight end of all time. I, nobody has ever done the things that he's doing at that position. And, and every single game plan, the other team is just trying to figure out how to stop him. That's like their first goal. And then they figure out the rest. But you see three guys being thrown at him on pass plays, you know? know. No tight end has ever dealt with that. It's kind of, you sort of feel like if they wanted to, they could throw him on every down. They and could. I don't think they want him to get hurt. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's like. They're choosing not to, but not for. I mean, but it, but it does say that in a crucial game, like a Super Bowl or something, you actually kind of could, right? You could, the, you could throw to him way more than you did in an, or, in an ordinary game. Yeah, you can you can tell there are certain times, like that Colts game, halftime. They come out. It's like I, I bet we start throwing a Gronk a little bit more here. Like they'll save it. They're so afraid he's going to get hurt though, because what's happening is he's so big. Every Pats fan knows what I'm talking about. He's so big. And he's going down the field with a full head of steam after he catches it. And the guys just go right at his legs. And that's how he got hurt in 2011. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, there's no other way to tackle him. And he, as a Patriot fan, you just live in cons or a fantasy football owner of Gronkowski. You live in constant fear. He catches that pass and turns around and there's that safety right at his knees. Yeah. And it's yeah. just the fear you live with every pack game, which is no different than what it was like with Pedro. Uh, yeah. When yeah. Pedro was at his peak, just every pitch worried that his arm was going to go out. Was going to. Wait, I want to go back to something you said about Manning, which is that 
What I don't understand is, given that we know this about Manning, that his performance is becoming increasingly variable up and yeah. down as he gets older, then why, if I'm the coach of the Broncos, don't I do what Popovich does? Start managing his minutes. Just like, sit him for I a have... game or two? What's that? Like, so just if they're 13-point favorites against so-and-so, he just doesn't play. Or he plays a uh, half. He's got to have a backup. I mean, going into the season, you should have said to yourself, he can, Manning can get us to the Super Bowl, but he can't get it to the Super Bowl by playing all 16 games start to finish. So let's have a – let's plan around having somebody else play roughly equal minutes. I'll um, go further than you. I thought they just should have started a season in November. Yeah. Because, like, this weekend should be his first game. Yeah. Like, yeah, all right, we're 4-4, four and four, and now we have Peyton Manning for the next 11 weeks. And maybe you're better off doing it that way. I, I don't know enough about how much repetition you need as a quarterback. And yeah. I, I think it's different in the NBA. In the NBA, those guys are like dogs. Like, you just they jump in the pool, and they're going to be able to swim. And they, they you can be a little bit rusty, but not that rusty. You can miss a game and come back the next game. But Manning, it's... of all the quarterbacks in the league, the, the quarterback most capable of – managing that kind of unorthodox playing time is him. Yeah. Right? I mean, we, he's so perfectly prepared. We talked about this in one of our back and forth. It might have even been the last one about uh, how hard it is now to compare eras and Brady talking about wanting to play till he's 45 or 48, which just seemed impossible 20 <laughs> years ago. Know. Now you think like, all right, well, you, you never get hit anymore. If you get hit, you always know you're going to get hit. Nobody cheap shots you. And nobody's yeah. cheap shotting your receivers. And there's all these restrictions on what defense can do. Maybe you could do it. I, I actually do really do think he could play till he's 45. I haven't seen any real signs of attrition from him other than he doesn't move quite as well. And he's maybe not totally as reliable on deep balls. But other than that, he looks like the same. It's, it's well, he definitely crazy. doesn't throw. The deep ball, I mean, I, I say it's only anecdotally. I don't know what the data says. But he doesn't seem like he throws the deep ball nearly as much as he did in, say, the Randy Moss era. Yeah, because he's not as accurate. And it took a while yeah. to realize that. It, it, yeah. it, the Pats fans, whenever Brady threw deep, it wasn't like with Moss. With Moss, it was like Moss is catching this. I don't care how many guys are on him. But uh, now it's, it's – I, I don't know how far this goes with him. I really, and, and by a similar token, LeBron is in year 13. He's never yeah. really had a major injury, and he's made the finals five years in a row. And at some point, it ends. Like Tate was coming here. Tate went to the Laker game last night. We were talking about how bad Kobe looks. And you think, like, well, he should look bad. It's his 20th season. Like, at some point, this has to end. Like, yeah. You're not going to play for 40 seasons. There's going to be a year where all of a sudden you're not good anymore. And it, it seems like Kobe's hit that point. But Brady and LeBron, I just have no feel for how long this is going to go. Like, if you told me right now Brady's going to play until 2025, I, I wouldn't bet against that. It's crazy. Why, the, better, the better question is why does he want to play that long? Yeah. Is it, as, at a certain point, um, is the kind of wear and tear and uh, is it still interesting and fun to wake up on a Monday morning after a football game when you're 43 and just feel what you, you know, what that, I don't know, man. Well, you I, know I what? Would... Like, I've talked about this before, but Nowitzki told me about this. He said, it's, it's not the games and it's, they, the things they love are being around teammates and just being an athlete. That part's awesome. The part that's not awesome is when it's like July 10th. And you have to set your alarm for 5.30 in the morning because your strength coach is coming over to work on your core for two hours. And then you have breakfast and then you have to go shoot a thousand threes. And it's like, it's like anything else. I mean, I'm sure both of us have felt that way about writing. Yeah. You know, where it's like, I know how to do this. Oh, no, there's a blank screen again. Now I got to come up with something. And, you know, there's only enough, enough times before you start going, oh, man, oof. And I think that's where athletes get to. I think it's the off-season training that's what kills them. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and that's why Duncan's an alien. Duncan, Duncan goes to like the Virgin Islands and he like swims with dolphins or whatever the hell Duncan does. <laughs> <laughs> and like eats bugs 
and, and does Tim Duncan things and like maybe goes in a spaceship when nobody's looking to Mars to eat hemoglobin from plants. I don't know what he does. It's amazing. How happy would it make you if the Spurs won the whole thing this year? Just it would just seem kind of great. This is the I didn't even make an NBA pick this year. This is the first year I had no idea who to pick. It, it just felt like eight eight teams could win. I will say that. I, I thought Houston was kind of the wild card, but it, it watching the games, it seems like the Clippers might be the wild card this year for a ce- from a ceiling standpoint. They're really? pretty good. Yeah, it's a pretty good team. I've been impressed by them. They uh, Blake's been amazing. They're deep. They have guys who can come off the bench now and change the game for a couple of minutes, and they know who they are, and Doc knows who they are, and it's just it's uh, the terrible logo and terrible uniforms aside, they look pretty good. Have you watched it all or no? Any any of the games? A little bit, not much. I've been. I, I I'm very very seasonal. As long as there's college football demanding my attention and the NFL, I can't make the, tra- the transition to 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 wholeheartedly to the NBA. Oh wait, that, I'm glad you brought this up because the LSU, the freak running backs, got his big game this weekend, and he's basically stuck in college. Because there's no rule that says he can go to the pros. Do you feel like as part, when I'm in charge when when Obama and I are the sports stars, we're gonna be co-sports stars. I just decided. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about a committee for freak athletes in high school or college? Like yeah. Connor McDavid last year should have just been in the NHL. Like why even play junior hockey again? Just get him in there. So what? He's 17. He's a freaking freak. He's w- w- the best prospect in 30 years. And by the way, he got hurt last night, uh, which sucked. But I think certain people you should just be able to make exemptions for, you know? Well, here's the thing. You can't have it both ways. Right now, college sports wants it both ways. They want to not play their athletes, even though they're making enormous sums of money off them. And simultaneously, they want to restrict their athletes' movements to places where they can make money. Yeah. So I'm like, you, so that guy, you can keep that kid in Ohio State in college for that extra year, sure, but pay him what he's worth then. So what's he worth to Ohio State? Million dollars a year, two million dollars. Pay him. Put the money in escrow. He can get it when he leaves college. But you can't. It's, it's just it's the hypocrisy of this position that you know we can formally limit your opportunity to make a living. And there is no one in America who doesn't think that these freaks, you know, there's one or two a year, can play at the professional level, right? There's no doubt about that. Well, uh, you talk about. We talked about. Uh, I sound like Phil Sims. Well, Malcolm, we talked earlier about uh, rich guys, and but um, you know, we talked about you know what the key uh, Phil Sims. You well, know how you do a Phil Sims imitation? It has to do with days of the week. All days of the week end in D E E, not D A Y. Oh, Sunday. You see a kid playing on Saturday, and you say, "I think he can play on Sunday." <laughs> <laughs> you talk about a kid who can play on Saturday. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but uh, but you talk about reallocating reallocating funds for stuff. So it's obviously idiotic for Wisconsin to pay for two rich guys to build their their stadium when they bought that team for a great price. They get to write off a million kajillion different things with it. It's only going to go up in value. Yeah, there's not they're not losing money buying the bucks. You know, yeah. so why are you helping them buy their stadium? It's a great question. Well, here's another thing. And this is why college sports is so annoying to me and why I just stay out of it. Everybody gets so agitated. It's it's such like an unassailable corner to say how college athletes should be paid. There's like no counter argument. Yeah, yeah, of course these guys should make more money, but nobody has a plan for it. But the thing that bothers me is these teams raking, these colleges raking so much money from these programs. What do they do with it? I would love to, if if, if I knew there was a better plan for exactly what they do with the money, then that would make sense to me. Like, for instance, if you're the sports czar, maybe you make a rule that college coaches are basically professors, right? It would be idiotic to pay a professor $7 million a year. So maybe there should be a cap on college coach salaries. Maybe no college coach should make more than $2 million a year. Well, you you have a situation in America now where in many states the – by far, the highest paid public employee in the state is the is the college football coach. That seems wrong. That seems 
<laughs> that seems just a little bit wrong. I think maybe we should start there. Yeah. You can't. But here, wait, there's a really simple way to solution to this. And I feel like we discussed this years ago, but maybe it was we in probably a, did. a conversation. It's been destroyed and in the archives. And that is that uh, any pro team, pro, in this case, we're talking football or, or basketball, can draft any a uh, college player that they want, regardless of how old they are. Yeah. And if the college player chooses to remain in the, uh, or chooses or has to remain in college, the money then just goes into escrow until they graduate. And it doesn't count off your cap. So some phenomenal freshman uh, comes out of high school, goes to commit to Louisville. Yeah. I'm the Celtics, I have the number one pick. I pick him, I don't get him for another year. And but I pay his rookie salary into a bank account and waits for him to graduate. How hard is that? It's a it's a good idea and it leads toward the way we should be thinking with a lot of this stuff, right? Like with the NBA. I don't know why we don't have the rule where the guy can come right out of high school, but if he doesn't get drafted in the lottery, then he can go, go to college for two years. Like why aren't we giving these guys more options? Yeah, yeah. If my man Ben Simmons, my family member for, at <laughs> LSU, my, my brother from Australia, if he wanted to come out last year and his expectation was, I'm going to go in the top five and then it doesn't happen, he should be able to go back. Yeah. You know? and they, Well, it, that's a simple matter. If the, if the people running the NCAA were even remotely creative or interested in the well-being of their players. They're not. That, could, that should be done in five minutes. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like this is another thing for Silver. You know, we both like Silver. Silver, tremendously thoughtful, intelligent guy. Silver just has to call up the NCAA. I feel like he could make it happen. I think he wants to. I think it's super important to him. My thing is, I don't understand how... All right, so Ben Simmons right now. He's at, he's at LSU. The season ends mid-March. You go to the tournament. You might win, I don't know, three, four games. Let's say he loses in round two. Mm -hmm. At that point, why did, why even stay in school? You're going to the NBA. Just leave the next day. Sorry, sorry, my four professors that are pretending to take classes with them out. Yeah. I have to go get ready to be in the NBA. It's it's idiotic. The whole thing is just ridiculous. You've Duke had four. What do they have? Four one and done guys and the team that won the title last year you think justice winslow was yeah. worried about like his classes and how what, what his gpa is gonna be all he's thinking about is getting ready for the draft yeah so yeah. something's got to be fixed my personal take is that if you play college sports you should have to play for two years and and if you don't and if you leave then they lose the scholarship and it should be two years it should be two year scholarship it should be like you know, if I give Justice Winslow a scholarship and he leaves after one year, I can't replace that scholarship for oh, a year. I see. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I like that idea. Put some onus on on the teams, and if they're going to re recruit those one and done guys, they pay a penalty. Yeah, there's a little bit of a penalty. You can't just do it every year. Coach K, who's done the greatest job ever of revising, you know, who he is, is just, you know, that that guy. My God, but he he, he expressed so much contempt about what Calipari, Calipari was doing. And meanwhile, I just replicated it. He figured out a smarter, kind of less publicized way to replicate it while coaching the Dream Team in 2008 and 2010, 12, 14, 16, which is the greatest recruiting tool you could ever have. Yeah, yeah. You know? He's in the homes of all these recruits. He's the guy, and he could. you don't think he could be like, you don't think he yeah. could say, hey, LeBron, can you call this guy for me? Yeah, no, can you give working. me a solid. He's, like, there's no way he doesn't do that. This is, I mean, this is what we've been talking about all through this podcast, which is there's, the system uh, is cor has been corrupted in some way, and a lot of what the successful people are doing now is just working at working at corruption. Right? They're just taking advantage of these loopholes, and it's time, I think, to take to pay. This is what the sports this is what Obama, the sports czar, needs to do, is to pay attention to the big picture. Yeah. Well, in this case, the big picture really is stuff like why is Wisconsin paying two hundred fifty million dollars for the for the Bucks owners? Where yeah. does all the money go from LSU's program if the star running back turns out to be the biggest stud in ten years and they're selling his jersey left and right 
is that money going toward professors? Is it going toward a building? Is it going toward the library? Where is it going? Who's getting it? I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answers to that. I've never read the right giant piece that explained it to me. Have you? Well, there was a book that came out recently John uh, Branch? About, about this. I think that made the argument that uh, there's a small group, like 10 or 12 teams, I think this is football, that make a lot of money off their football program, the ones you would expect, the Florida States, the Oklahomas, Alabama. Mm. And then there's a an e much larger group in the middle who are trying to make the top 12, failing and losing a ton of money. Yeah. So those are the ones that we ought to be concerned about. Those that sounds like any, doesn't that sound like every business though? <laughs> really like... It is, except in this case, you know, they're, they're not supposed to be businesses. They're supposed to be nonprofit institutions yeah. furthering the education of young people in America, right? I mean, that's the problem, that they're, they're, they're so caught up in pursuing this completely tangential yeah. operation of college sports that they've lost sight of what they're supposed to be doing. They should not be taking money out of the pockets of the education of, of everyday students, right? Well, and that's what made the Harvard thing so amazing when, when the coaches realized that they had this incredible loophole being in the Ivy League where you could basically just, if you screwed up with some scholarship, like if I gave you a scholarship, I thought you were gonna be awesome. And it turned out you weren't that good, you're a bench guy. Now you're a junior. I could be like, you know what? Sorry, I'm taking the scholarship back, thanks though. You get to stay here. And then yeah. I just give that scholarship to somebody else. The, w the irony of this whole thing is the Ivy League, you have the best chance to build the greatest possible team. As long as you found people that were smart enough to get into your school, you you basically the only t you're the only school that doesn't have the scholarship salary cap. Yeah, is well, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that the Ivy Leagues would have figured out the best angle. Wait, last thing, and then and then we've gone way too long. I took too much of your time. Although I'm really having fun, I haven't talked to you in a while. Uh, yeah. PDS, which we yeah. always circle back around. They had this thing recently, a few months ago. It was after I, I left ESPN. I can't remember what month when the story came out about how they had retested all the samples in London oh, yeah. from, uh, what was it? Track and field and swimmers. And like everyone failed I, every single athlete, all of them. It was just a hundred percent failure rate. Well, two, two responses. One is, you know, the news that broke today, which is that the former head of the um, IAF has just been arrested on charges of taking bribes from the Russians to cover up <laughs> no. doping violations. So, like, the head of track and field internationally, the former yeah. head, is uh, now revealed to have been on the tape to cover up. It's, like, unbelievable. It's, like, it's like they, this is the biggest story to hit. I mean, very few people in America are track and field fans. I happen to be one of them. Yeah. This is the biggest story to hit track and field in years. I, mean, I would say believable, not unbelievable. You could, you could <laughs> any, any of those guys, I'm just assuming, are getting bribed. Yeah. But the, the London stuff was that... Uh, uh, it wasn't everyone, but it was a pretty, uh, pretty significant percentage of yeah, people was, had questionable. Yeah, but had questionable. I mean, I thought higher than I would have imagined. Yeah, and it, it just, it just, it breaks my heart, you know, because um, I'm, I mean, although I have very, very convicted, complicated feelings about doping, because I don't feel that we always make the right kinds of arguments. Nonetheless, um, to think that there were races that were decided because one guy got away with uh, with taking drugs and someone else didn't is, I mean, that's just, that's just, it's so heartbreaking. And the um, test, the, the the drugs are always ahead of the test. They are always right? ahead of it. Well, the can I do a shout out to, on this general question, Yeah, I continue, I'm totally fascinated as always by the Lance Armstrong story. I yeah. went back and read a book, read, written 10 years ago or more about Armstrong called Lance Armstrong's War by Daniel Coyle, oh. who went on to write a bunch of other really good books. It is so fantastic. It's the best book I've, well, one of the best sports books I've ever read, but one of the best books, if you're ever gonna read a book on cycling and how weird and hilarious and screwed up the cycling world is, yeah. this is the one, this guy did a unbelievable job of just bringing it to light. And he doesn't really talk that, I mean, it's all before the drug stuff broke. It's just about, the insanity of professional cycling is just like the weirdest sport you've ever encountered. It's, it's and you book. know what's great about cycling? One of my favorite things, because you see it, because, you know, in California, Malibu's there and the PCH, and there's that 28 mile stretch where all the bicyclers are riding down there. 
It's the only sport where the people who aren't the professionals try to dress exactly like the professionals. I know. Like if I if I liked auto racing, I wouldn't go into my car dressed like a NASCAR driver. <laughs> wearing like a fire retardant suit and a helmet. Yeah, These guys are all, they're at like the Starbucks in Malibu wearing, wearing Tour de France outfits. They're in their yep. late 50s. Not, only this, not just that, the yellow jersey. Yeah. Like they're leading, like they're leading the Tour de France after, you know. Yeah. What are you doing? You're 58. <laughs> yeah. You're going 21 miles an hour instead of 20. Like, I, I think it's, it's hilarious. My it favorite. Is. It is kind of like hilarious. when I play, if I was playing semi-pro baseball, I, w I wouldn't dress up like Babe Ruth. Yeah. You know, wear like yeah. heavy, heavy wool uniforms. <laughs> anyway, uh, anything to plug? Any stories coming? Uh, you know, nothing of any, I'm, I got long-term stuff I'm doing for the New Yorker, but, um, no, uh, right now I'm still in the beginning phase on most stuff. So. No, no book that's going to dominate every airport for five years. <laughs> that's not I happening. I have some ideas, but they're a little far off, so. Look uh, far off, like far off to do or far off for? Uh, it's funny. I just had today lunch with my agent and had a, a minor discussion about a future book idea. So that's where I am. Does, is she just looking at you like like a hungry person just staring at you <laughs> like, hey, so uh, any book ideas, Malcolm? Agents are always interested to hear about upcoming projects. That's all I'll say. Mm. Wow. Uh, this was fun. Great fun. I'm glad we did this. Please yep. come back on the Bill Simmons podcast. It was a pleasure. It Thanks for pleasure. listening to me, by the way. Thanks to audible.com, the home of over 180,000 audio programs from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, and business information providers. Catch up on all the hot reading during your daily commute with audible.com. And just because they like me, audible.com is offering a free audiobook of your choice and a free 30 day trial membership. Wow. Go to audible.com slash BS and start your free trial today. Today's episode of the BS podcast was also brought to you by stamps.com for a four week trial plus a $110 bonus offer that includes postage and a digital scale. Go to stamps.com, click on that microphone at the top of the homepage and type in BS. That's stamps.com, enter BS, play us out, Tupac. We about this bitch.